diving into a story that's uh, making headlines. Um, from Equatorial Guinea. It's a story about sex tapes, government officials, and a whole lot of questions about power. Yeah. Accountability. Yeah, it's not just some salacious scandal. I mean, it really reveals these uh, yeah. these underlying power dynamics, you know, and how they play out in a society like Equatorial Guinea. Exactly. And at the center of this whole thing is Baltazar Ngonga, yeah. the director general of the National Financial Investigation Agency. He was recently arrested after they found over 400 sex tapes of him mm. and various prominent women. Wow. 400. 400. And, you know, as director general, he held a position of immense power. So this wasn't just, you know, a guy with a private collection or something. This was someone who yeah. could exert significant influence over people's lives. And the list of women involved is pretty shocking. I mean, we're talking his brother's wife, yeah. his cousin, president's sister, wives of several government ministers, even wife of the police director. It just seems like he was, mm -hmm. you know, not exactly shy about leveraging his power. Right. And that's what makes things so complex, because the attorney general has said that consensual sex isn't a crime. But the sheer volume of these tapes and the power dynamics at play here, you have to wonder if real consent was even possible in all these situations. Exactly. I mean, were these women genuinely consenting or were they pressured, even coerced maybe, into these encounters? because of Ngonga's position. Right, and how do you even begin to untangle those power dynamics to figure out if there was true consent, especially when you consider the potential consequences yeah. that these women might have faced if they refused? Yeah, it's a tough question. And to make things even more complicated, many of these videos have been leaked online, which has caused a huge media frenzy, hmm. especially on local platforms like Ahura EG. Oh, wow. So think about the impact on these women, you know, regardless of whether they consented to the recordings or not. This public release is a massive violation of their privacy. It could have a devastating impact on their personal and professional lives. Absolutely. And the attorney general even expressed concern about potential public health risks, too, mm -hmm. associated with the scandal. It's just, it's a multifaceted situation, for sure. The implications extend far beyond Nganga himself. So with all this unfolding, how has the government responded? Well, they've taken action, uh, pretty swift action, actually. They've suspended all officials who are involved in any sort of sexual activity within government offices. And the vice president has made it clear that there is a zero tolerance policy on this kind of behavior, no. emphasizing the importance of ethics no. and respect within the administration. Damage control. It sounds like damage control. But is it enough? I mean, Nganga was already facing corruption charges before this whole thing broke. Does this point to maybe mm. a larger pattern of misconduct? Within the government. That's a good question. It very well could be just the tip of the iceberg, yeah. What I find <laughs> fascinating is that this case goes beyond the, you know, mm. the tapes themselves. Help us understand that. What's the bigger picture here? It really highlights the complexities of power and consent, especially when you look at the specifics of Equatorial Guinea. So, like, what are we talking about here? When we say specifics, what are those cultural factors that could influence these power dynamics and gender roles? Well, Equatorial Guinea has a history shaped by, you know, colonialism, decades of authoritarian rule. Traditionally, it's a very patriarchal society. Men hold most of the power and influence, both in public and private life. And that makes it really hard for women to kind of assert themselves, especially when they're dealing with men in positions of authority. So even if a woman holds a position of authority, like some of these women in this case, the broader societal context might still put them at a disadvantage. Oh, absolutely. There's this disconnect between a woman's official position and their actual power within the societal structure, you know, and that can lead to these situations where women feel pressured to conform to traditional expectations, even if it means compromising their own, you know, well-being. Well, okay. So it's almost like there's these unwritten rules that kind of govern how women are expected to behave, even if those rules contradict their formal status, right? Exactly. And those unwritten rules can make it really difficult for women to, you know, speak out against abuse or exploitation, especially when the perpetrator is someone powerful. There's a fear, you know, of not being believed, of being ostracized, even of facing some kind of retaliation. And in a case like this, where it's so public, there's the added fear of social stigma and reputational damage. Exactly. These women are now facing intense public scrutiny, regardless of the circumstances surrounding the recordings, their reputations, relationships are probably going to suffer. And this kind of highlights another crucial aspect of this case, which is the tension between traditional values and the digital age. Okay, interesting. So we've talked about how privacy is kind of becoming increasingly fragile in the digital world. 
world, but how does it specifically clash with traditional values in a place like Equatorial Guinea? Well, Equatorial Guinea is, you know, a relatively conservative society. Matters of sexuality are typically kept very private. The public airing of these tapes. You know, even if some of those encounters were consensual, it violates those deeply ingrained cultural norms. It's a stark reminder that the digital age is forcing societies to confront and reevaluate their traditional values. And it's not just about the videos themselves. It's the online commentary, the speculation. Yeah. That just kind of adds another layer of discomfort and shame for those involved. Absolutely. Social media can be this powerful tool, you know, for amplifying voices, shedding light on injustices. But it can also be a breeding ground for rumors and gossip and judgment. In a case like this, where those lines between public and private are so blurred, it's really important to think about the impact on everyone. It feels like we're like navigating uncharted territory here. Mm -hmm. How do we reconcile those traditional notions of privacy and respect with, you know, a, a world where information spreads so quickly and easily? Yeah, it's a question without easy answers. But the first step is to acknowledge that the old rules they just don't apply anymore. We need to have these open and honest conversations about, you know, digital ethics, privacy, and responsible use of technology, and be mindful of those potential consequences of our actions online, both for ourselves and for others. We need to remember that there are real people at the heart of this story, people whose lives are being profoundly impacted by everything that's happened. This case raises so many questions about power, consent, accountability. It's a story that resonates far beyond Equatorial Guinea. It really makes us examine our own values and behaviors in this you know. increasingly interconnected world. Earlier, we talked about Nganga's corruption charges and how that might connect to the broader theme of power dynamics. Can you kind of unpack that a bit more? Yeah, of course. It's important to remember that Nganga was already under investigation for corruption before any of this came to light. So this suggests a pattern of behavior, a willingness to abuse his power, not just for, you know, sexual gratification, but potentially for financial gain as well. So this isn't just a guy with a thing for recording his encounters. It's about a man who was using his position to, you know, enrich himself, and exploit others, yeah. potentially. Exactly. And that raises even more questions about the culture of impunity that might exist within the government. You know, if Ngongo was able to do all this for so long, what does that say about those systems of accountability mm -hmm. that are supposed to be in place? It makes you wonder what else might be going on. Right. And it makes you question whether the government's response, well, you know, swift and decisive, is really getting to the root of the problem. It's definitely a step in the right direction, but true accountability. It requires a deeper look at the systems and structures that enable this kind of abuse of power. And it also requires a shift in cultural attitudes mm -hmm. towards women and a recognition that, you know, equality, it requires more than just legislation. It requires a fundamental change in how we view and treat each other. That's such an important point. So as we're wrapping up this part of our deep dive, what would you say is that key takeaway you'd like our listener to kind of ponder? Yeah, it's a real wake-up call. It makes you think about your own digital footprint and the choices you make online. It does. Mm -hmm. I mean, this case is just a stark reminder that those actions, you know, in the digital world, they have real-world consequences, I see. especially now when information just spreads so fast. And we were talking about having these conversations about digital ethics and privacy. What does that look like? I mean, how do we actually do that? Well, I think being aware of your digital footprint is a good place to start. I mean, yeah. every time you post online or share a picture or even just browse a website, you're creating data that can yeah. be collected and analyzed and, yeah. you know, potentially used against you. It's easy to forget about that when you're, you know, in the moment. Right. Like it's so easy to get caught up in social media or the convenience of online services. Yeah. But it's important to remember that it's not just about protecting your own privacy. It's about respecting other people's privacy as well. So before you share a photo or a video, you know, just think about whether everyone in it would consent to having that content out there publicly. And that gets even trickier when you're dealing with, you know, sensitive content, like in this case. Absolutely. And this case highlights the need for more awareness, you know, mm. more education around it. consent and privacy and online safety. We need to be having these conversations everywhere, in schools, workplaces, even at home. It feels like we need to hold our leaders accountable, too for upholding these values in both their public and private lives. Right, I mean, we can't expect ethical and responsible behavior online if our leaders aren't setting the example. We have to demand transparency and accountability from those in power. So while this whole scandal is yeah. deeply troubling, it is an opportunity for us to like okay. reflect and have these conversations. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, it forces us to look at some some uncomfortable truth about the society we live in and the choices we make every day. And I think it also challenges us to rethink our relationship with technology and how we can have a more ethical, responsible approach to you know, this digital world that we live in. So much to think about for our listeners as we wrap up this deep dive. What's the what's the one thing you really want to leave them with? The biggest takeaway, I think it's just to be more mindful in this age of, you know, hyperconnectivity. We need to be thinking about the power of information mm -hmm. and the impact of our actions, you know, online. It's time to move past just the, you know, the details of this specific scandal and really have a bigger conversation about how we can build a more just and equitable digital future, one where privacy is respected and, you know, consent is at the forefront and there's accountability. Well said. This deep dive has been yeah. a yeah. lot to unpack. The story that goes way beyond the headlines brings up all these questions about power and responsibility and the very idea of consent in the digital age. Yeah, it reminds us that even in a world where we're always connected sometimes, <laughs> some things are better left unshared. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive. We'll catch you next time.